Did you know that the bats in Elden Ring can sing? Or at least they could once. In the network test files of Elden Ring is unused animation 702, which places the bats in this upright pose singing this mysterious song. <laughs> When this was discovered, the question quickly became, what language is this? Because while it sounds distinctly Japanese, it's not. It's actually Ainu, a language that is considered to be critically endangered, with just 304 people within Japan able to understand the language to some extent. So even you hearing this is just such a rare sound, and while it might have always been nothing more than a placeholder song, I'm glad that we can all share in this song, called Heretun Rutun, and sung by the late Umeko Ando. The singing bat was unearthed by renowned modder Sekido Dubi, and I highly recommend their cut content videos. Links in the description, as always. If this song was always just intended to be a placeholder, then it was intended to be a placeholder for the Song of Lament, which is a song in Latin that did make it into the final version of the game. Unlike other excerpts of Latin that feature in boss soundtracks in From Software games, this song, sung by the Harpies, is completely translatable, with lyrics that tell us a story. These Harpies are actually singing Alas, that land once blessed now has diminished. We, betrothed, destined to be mothers, now become tarnished. We have lamented, and we have shed tears, but no one consoles us. Golden One, at whom were you so angry? So that land is obviously a reference to the lands between, and the remaining lines are referring to the harpies themselves. Though they have now lost grace, they longed at one point for betrothal and motherhood. Their cries in the final line are for the Golden One, who could be Marika or the Greater Will that once blessed the lands between. The Harpies now wonder what they've done to deserve such a lamentable fate. Again, most of From Software's soundtracks use excerpts of Latin resulting in this untranslatable soundtrack language, as confirmed by the composers themselves in the past. The Song of Lament is a clear exception, however, and it being written in actual Latin points to its significance. Special thanks to YouTuber and Latin student Antonius Tertius for their detailed and reliable breakdowns of Latin in From Software's games. So the Harpies not being able to be mothers is one thing, but if we go back to the network test of Elden Ring, we learn of other things that might stand in the way of reproduction in the Lands Between. Let's talk about the old description of turtle neck meat. Originally, turtle neck meat was supposed to boost virility, but none in the Lands Between seem to have much appetite for it these days. In the Lands Between, the urge to reproduce has waned long ago. And while the description has since been changed, it does suggest that the urge for reproduction is long dead amongst all tarnished. But I guess they were all maidenless anyway, right? There is some evidence that birth is now handled by the Erd tree, but that discussion might have to wait for another video. So for now, pickle your turtle neck meat and consider doing something more productive with that stamina boost. The tarnished can, after all, cook up some pretty good stuff in Elden Ring. Unlike me, uh, the next secret is I can't, I can't cook, unless it's with HelloFresh. So if you don't know, HelloFresh is this subscription service that provides you with pre-proportioned ingredients right to your doorstep, meaning less prep for you and less wasted food as well. As soon as you've signed up with the link below, you can open the app and choose your menu for the coming week. Here, you can choose from a really wide range of options, and then you can upgrade your meals or even customize your box by adding or swapping out certain proteins. The recipes are pretty foolproof, and many meals are designed to be ready in 30 minutes or less, with instructions so clear, I could even manage to cook and film at the same time. This week, I chose four meals. I chose a Caesar-style pork burger, roast chicken with creamy peppercorn sauce, a quick chorizo and zucchini pasta, and the smoked cheddar beef burger. So, if you're keen to learn how to cook some meals that look like this, 
please use my link or go to hellofresh.com and use code pogvideaoct 65 for 65% off plus free shipping on your first box. So prepare to fry and let's get back to the video. Speaking of talented chefs, let's talk about Blackguard Big Bogart. Despite his title, Blackguard, he doesn't actually belong to any Blackguard company or order. He's not a professional knight or a guard of anything which fits his character, given how he accosts Raya and steals her necklace. But perhaps therein lies the answer. The name Blackguard is actually the word blackguard in the Japanese version of the game, which is another word for scoundrel, or one who uses foul language in front of a respectable woman, which... Marik is tits. Yeah, that tracks. Chat with him though, and this tough exterior begins to melt away. But we'll talk more about Bogart in the upcoming Prepare to Cry episode. Be a shame if anything were to happen to him, right? Speaking of foreshadowing, Elden Ring foreshadows events right away from the very first step. Looking out from here, you'll notice several key landmarks that hint at what's to come. The most obvious is Stormvale Castle, and then of course the Erd Tree, but there's a third landmark that I only recently noticed that towers even further in the distance, the forge housing the giant's flame. It's here where you'll fight the fire giant and ignite one of the most important flames in your Elden Ring journey, but catching a clear glimpse of it from the first step is pretty difficult, even with the telescope. However, you can increase the telescope's magnification for a better look with the help of the Arrow's Reach Talisman, which brings me to my next secret, that the Arrow's Reach Talisman increases the range of your bows and crossbows, and yes, your binoculars as well, but that's not all. You'd be forgiven for not knowing this, but it also increases the range of Rock Sling, Great Oracular Bubble, Ambush Shard, and it even affects some Ashes of War, like Spectral Lance and Beast's Roar. And as you just saw, some of these actually become a fair bit more viable with this talisman. That's more than can be said for most of the crossbows and bows, which just have terrible scaling in general and limited viability beyond luring enemies to you. You loot this talisman above the gatefront site of Grace. Actually, from here, we can just see Bok's hiding place, and I'd like to talk about him a little bit more, since it's unlikely he will feature in any upcoming episodes. As we've mentioned before, armor alteration has a cost if you perform it at a site of Grace, but it can be performed for free by Bok. And if you want to keep Bok around for the entire game, then it's important not to give him a larval tear when he requests one in Laindel. Doing so will send him down an unfortunate, deadly path, a fate that is actually foreshadowed earlier in his questline. If given the larval tear, Bok will make his way to Renala, where he'll be reborn in human form, but unable to speak. And if you reload the area, you'll then find him dead, curled up in a corner. This position is foreshadowed in one of the earliest conversations with Bok, where, after reclaiming his sewing needle, he reminisces about his mother. My mum was a seamstress, and that sewing kit was all I had to remember her by. I always wanted to be just like sweet old mum. Oh, then I s suppose I, I can't just curl up and die, can I? The larval tear, unfortunately, doesn't have the same rebirthing effect on him as it does on you. The Great Rune of the Unborn holds a warning of this as well, with its description reading, Children born anew by Renala are all frail and short-lived. So, when the time comes and he asks for a larval tear, it's worth using a prattling pate item instead to tell him how beautiful he is. You're beautiful. Thank you very much. Mum was always the only one who said I was beautiful. And now, my dear lord, let me hear her voice. Do you feel the same way my mum did, my lord? Do you think I'm beautiful, despite these looks? <laughs> oh, my lord, my dear lord, I, Bok the Seamster, am forever in your service. May the throne of Elden Lord be yours. 
sometimes it's easy to overlook these smaller items and the impact they can have on the world around you. The crystal darts are another example of this. In a previous video, we discussed how the Erd Tree burial watchdogs and imps short circuit when struck with them, attacking each other in the process. But did you know that the giant golems also experience this effect? They take a few more hits than imps or burial watchdogs do, but they will turn on each other just the same. Given the crystal darts description, which reads, a golem crafter employed a similar crystal tool, it appears that the giant golems have the same creator as the imps and the burial watchdogs. Perhaps this golem crafter wanted an easy way to keep them all controlled, and could do so through these darts. Morgoth's cursed sword is another interesting item. Its description reads, A cursed blood that Morgoth recanted and sealed away reformed into this blade. It also has quite the introduction as Morgoth reveals its iridescent design by breaking the outer shell of his cane. However, this reveal has undergone a bit of a change in recent patches. Originally, in patch 1.02, this animation featured flames rippling through the cracks of his cane, which is a detail that suited him remarking how you're emboldened by the flame of ambition. But this has since been removed. As pointed out by a user on Reddit, since patch 1.04 the flames have disappeared and the outer shell of his cane now just crumbles away. This change is minor, but I don't think it's a bug, I think it's intentional. By removing the flame, it actually holds back the reveal of what this sword is capable of, which actually takes place in the second phase, not the first phase. Uh, its unique skill is Cursed Blood Slice, which leaves this bloody trail, followed by a burst of flame, and taking away this foreshadowing gives this weapon a chance to show off what makes it special in the fight itself. This look of madness is one that's only seen in select locations in Elden Ring, but it is easily recognisable through glowing flame-like eyes. You can even give your character these eyes by pursuing the Lord of Frenzy flame ending, and the moment you get these eyes is when you're embraced by the three fingers. These eyes are actually only one of three different variations that you can give your character though. Blood red eyes are another option that appear once Vare's questline has been completed, and dragon eyes appear after purchasing four separate dragon communion incantations. If you find these aren't your style, or you remove them accidentally, you can enable or disable these eyes through the mirror in Fia's room. These eye colours just scratch the surface of what Elden Ring offers in terms of customization. To help figure out players' favourites, Japanese magazine Famitsu conducted a survey with 1,700 Elden Ring players back in April. This covered everything from bosses to weapons to which locations were players' favourites. So despite the wide variety of weapon types available, Katanas won over 841 of these 1700 players, that's almost half the votes, and it does make sense considering how coveted the Moonvale and Rivers of Blood are, and there's rarely been a bad Katana in a Souls game after all. Greatswords came in close behind with 641 votes, for magic users, Comet Azur was a top choice of attack with 240 votes. Again, this makes sense with how unbeatable it can be when stacked with the right buffs. And you might be wondering which Spirit Ashes took the prize. It's not surprising to learn that the Mimic tier was at the top of the list, but Black Knife Tish as well came in at a close second. As for bosses, Star Scourge Radan left the greatest impact on players with 687 votes, and Perhaps unsurprisingly, Millennia came in just behind him at 658. As for endings, Rani's ending is by far people's favourite, and Caled and Limgrave came out on top in regards to areas, with 456 and 409 votes respectively. But every location in Elden Ring contains hidden details, and even now I'm still noticing new things when I explore the world, just tucked away in a piece of map that I've somehow missed until now. A perfect example lies here, in a northwesterly area of the Altus Plateau. Here, you might have noticed an unusual concentration of death blighted creatures, as well as a minor Erd tree that is completely dead, with a small gathering at its base. The spread of this death blight is actually due to the location that lies beneath all of this, the Deep Root Depths. It's here where Godwin, the Prince of Death, is rotting away. 
Slowly, his death route has started to make its way through the lands between, which explains why creatures both above and below can be seen with his postules of death, especially the closer they are to Godwin's throne. It's these small details that really make Elden Ring's world and story, and these kind of details can also be plucked out of cutscenes. One Reddit user, credit to them, found one very important detail during Godfrey's cutscene. It's that there is actually a guidance of grace in this scene that is directing him towards you as his next objective. The most important detail in this scene actually ties into where this grace is coming from, Morgoth's body. As Godfrey sets him down and he dissolves, the guidance then points him to his next purpose, defeating you. For number 15, let's talk about Patches. Everyone knows by now that he disappears when summoned for the fight against Radan. It's funny, and it suits the cowardice inherent in his character, which was set up earlier when he begs for mercy against you. But did you know that you can later beg for mercy against him? If you attack Patches and he manages to lower your health to half, he tells you to grovel instead. Doing so grants you the extreme repentance gesture, and once performed, he says he'll forgive you and considers your transgression water under the bridge. This is quite a fun way to show that even though he's deceitful and insincere, Patches actually has the ability to be reasonable. It's also a moment where you can pick up another gesture, so don't miss it. One thing you might have missed is located here, at the Stargazer's ruins in the mountaintops of the Giants. Here, Aureliette is searching for her sister, Aurelia. Sister, where did you go? You promised me when we turned 14, we go to see the stars. I've been waiting ever so long, forever and ever it seems. And if you've spoken to Roderica, then Aurelia has actually been traveling with you this whole time. The spirit jellyfish Roderica gave you back then is Aurelia, proven by her description, which also reads that she's a jellyfish prone to tears who is searching for her distant home. Reuniting the two sees them setting off to see the stars, but the moment is made bittersweet by the truth of what actually happened to them. Of course, they're both spirits, and if you continue down the cliffside beyond the ruins, you'll find two small graves. It would seem that the sisters died young, with their one final wish being to see the stars. I'm not sure why they couldn't see the stars before this. Maybe they belonged to the Nox, who were banished down to the Eternal Cities, and they only just made their way up here. But regardless, thanks to you, it seems, they are finally able to be at peace. Another interesting character who can give you their spirit ashes is Latena, who is an Albanoric woman who longs to return to the land of Mikola's Halig Tree. And interestingly, this spirit is actually able to mount other nearby direwolves in special circumstances, just like the other Albanoric wolfback archers in the game. User Neopie on Reddit made this discovery, showing how Latena's spirit ash can ride direwolves in both Carrier Manor and the consecrated snowfields. So not only does this allow her to move around much quicker, but she can also cast Freezing Mist while mounted. This is also a completely unique behavior to Latena. Uh, Kaiden spirits can't ride Kaiden horses, nor can Nox spirits ride giant ants, like their actual counterparts in-game can. According to Zuli the Witch, this might occur because the Albanoric archers can't move, so wolves have to be coded to go to them. Thus, the wolves actually are the ones with the ride request functions in their logic, but the Nox Ants and the Kaiden Horses do not have this by comparison. For number 18, did you know that Gostok is actually one of Elden Ring's sneakiest and most deceptive NPCs? From the moment you meet him, this character is actually following you around Stormvale Castle unseen, and while he's doing this, he is stealing 30% of the runes that you get in this area each time you die. But, lucky for you, there's a few ways to stop this rune tax from occurring. You can, of course, kill Gostok, which also nets you his bell bearing, 
but then you miss out on the ancient dragon smithing stone that he grants you at the end of his questline. If you'd prefer to stop him in a less permanent fashion, you can actually catch him stalking you around the castle. You can find him following you here, at the very bottom floor below the door that needs the rusty key, here next to the rampart tower grace in the tower behind you, and here on the rooftop above where you first meet Roger. Talking to him in these locations puts an end to his meddling and ensures that you can keep all of your runes. Gostok actually has a couple of aspects around him that are easy to overlook, like his missing hand, for example. The most likely explanation of this is that he was grafted in the past, considering how he's living in the home of Godric the Grafted, after all this would make sense, and his hatred of Godric points to this as well. It's clear that Gostok's no stranger to grafting, but there are moments where it sounds like he almost wants to do it to others. When following you around Stormvale, particularly at his second location, you'll find him crouched near a dead body saying, Another one, another one, all skin and bones. Worse than a petty squire. Ah, not a muscle on this one either. Once you begin talking to him, he'll explain that ah, he's just clearing out some corpses. And it could be that he's just looting these bodies, but the focus on muscle is an interesting detail. This theory can be pushed a bit further if you attack him early on and let him kill you. Going back to Elden Ring's closed network test, it actually has a couple more interesting secrets within it that were sadly left on the cutting room floor so long ago. One very interesting thing involves Rani the Witch, who Sekiro Dubi was able to discover originally had a double voice to match her double face. What do you think of this voice recreation? A pleasure to meet thee, Tarnished. I am the Witch Rena. I'd heard tell of a Tarnished hurtling about atop a spectral steed. Do you think this is better than Rani's regular voice, or is it too much? There were several other changes made between the closed network test and the full release, including an important change made to the description of the Daedekar's Woe talisman. In the final version of Elden Ring, Daedekar's Woe describes a woman named Daedeka, who indulged in every form of adultery and wicked pleasure imaginable, giving birth to a myriad of grotesque children. Originally though, Daedeka was described as an entirely different character, Earlier text describes them as a soft-featured man, who was one of Captain Rykard's paramours as well as an attendant in his Inquisition. Considering this talisman is dropped by Raya, its current iteration befits her backstory as this poor unwanted offspring of a repellent birthing ritual per the Serpent's Amnion. Perhaps Raya was even one of these grotesque children the description mentions. Another minor change made to a character was the removal of Radan's pet cat. The long-tail cat description found in version 1.0 of the game featured a description reading, a brooch depicting a long-tailed cat known to be the beloved pet of General Radan. It goes on to say that this black cat was known to have enjoyed jumping down from great heights. It would leap from the great bell tower of Raya Lucaria as a kitten and once fully grown, from the great heavenswood roots that twisted through the Erd Tree capital skies. Unfortunately, this description has been edited out for some reason, but even though official word of Radan's cat is kind of gone, this small detail helps to paint this grander picture of the conqueror of the stars. Along with the love that he clearly has for his horse, it seems that before his life as an Elden Ring boss, he was simply an animal lover. Speaking of animals, there's a piece of Garank's storyline that's very easy to miss. After receiving a few deathroot, he lashes out at you, and after that, at some point, there's even a moment where you might catch him howling at the night sky outside. Or, perhaps, given his direction, maybe he's howling at the Erd Tree. Of course, Garank, or Malaketh, was Marika's shadow, and it's kind of heartbreaking to think that he's howling in her direction here, imprisoned as she is inside the Erd Tree. For number 24, let's talk about Sir Gideon Ofnir. During your battle with him, he utilizes a ton of spells and incantations, but have you ever wondered how he gets all these spells? Well, YouTuber Garden of Eyes explains that there's actually a default set of spells that Gideon has. Comet, 
Comet Azure, Carrion Phalanx, Black Flame Ritual, Triple Rings of Light, Law of Causality, and one open slot. This open spot is determined by whether or not you've killed Rykard, Melania, or Moog, the Lord of Blood, which are all optional bosses. And depending on which one of these that you've killed, Rykard's Rancor, Melania's Scarlet Aeonia, or Moog's Blood Boon can be placed in that open slot. If you've killed two of these bosses, then one of their abilities will replace Comet Azur, and killing all three will also replace Triple Rings of Light. And for our final secret, Gideon isn't the only boss that relies on others for his attacks. One of the ancestral spirits also utilizes the smaller animal spirits that roam around the boss arena to mix up its attack patterns. As pointed out by Zuli the Witch, the ancestral spirit will move through the room, bursting through different animals to restore health and obtain some of their characteristics. For example, if it absorbs a deer, then it gains an upwards antler thrust. Absorbing a boar grants it the ability of a ramming charge, while spring hairs give it a jumping stomp, and the goats provide these rolling attacks. I love this detail, and so many of the details in this video. Thank you so much for watching. Special thanks also to HelloFresh for sponsoring this video. Uh, you guys will like, I think, what I've been investing some of this sponsor money into soon. With the next Prepare to Cry, you'll see some of that. So please do check out the link in the description for HelloFresh. It really does help me out. And I'm glad I found a couple of sponsors that I actually have a history with using even before they approached me. So thank you so much for the support. And I'll see you next time.